What's up my little nerds and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? If you're into the history between the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here to hear about Odysseus getting into a little bit of a fight. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be going into book 18 of Homer's Odyssey. So if I could summarize book 18 into a one sentence it would be that a random beggar king challenge Challenges Odysseus in disguise to a fight and he loses. Duh. Like, it's just one of those things that as soon as you're reading the book, you're like, I know exactly how this is gonna pan out. Yeah, we have to go through the motions anyways. And it's a very random, I've said this for a lot of things, but I have to say that it, it seems kind of random, but we have to bear in mind in these books leading up to all of the suitors being killed by Odysseus that we need to push him over the edge to really hating them and us as the audience need to really hate them as well so that when Odysseus does kill all of them as we know that he will because it's been like prophesized a hundred thousand times and um, that, that nobody is really attached to them and nobody's like oh no how could you kill the suitors by that point we're like yes kill all the suitors so in saying all of that why don't we just roll into the narrative of this book so at the end of the last book as you guys know if you've watched that if you haven't I do advise that you always watch the episode before the one that you need because it will just help make all of this make some contextual sense so Eumaeus leaves the swineherd leaves the feast right so we have this feast going on in the palace it's getting really late anyway so he decides that he's gonna leave he's sort of you know done his little dues there and he can go home once he leaves the start of this book is that there's a random beggar who walks in but this random beggar, I say random beggar he actually is the most famous beggar on Ithaca so everybody actually knows who he is his name is I had to write it down because I wasn't gonna remember his actual name is Arnaeus it's spelled like this but his nickname is Eris right so everybody calls him Eris I'm gonna be calling him Eris for the rest of this video so he's the most famous beggar on Ithaca he's the one that everyone knows so he will into the palace and sort of without any sort of I mean really this is just totally uncalled for he looks over at Odysseus like like to the side because Odysseus is right by the door still and he looks over to him he's sitting on the ground and he just starts hurling insults at him like literally just sort of walks in turns to him goes ah a beggar in my spot and just starts yelling at him literally as early as line 12 this man calls Odysseus in disguise an old goat which like uh, why and he goes on to say to Odysseus in disguise on the floor that he's like all of the suitors in the room they're currently giving me eyes that I should really come down here and just beat your ass because I totally can all of this you might want to get up before we actually have to come to blow so that you're ready and and obviously Odysseus just kind of turns to him and is like what the f are you on about and more importantly what he highlights in this moment is that there's more than enough room for both of them where he's sitting so he's like I don't know why the f you hate me so much already you can just sit next to me like I don't mind you can come sit here so do fine we can be mates and obviously the other guy doesn't like this because everybody is super hot-headed in this scene and he turns Iris turns to Odysseus in disguise again after you know doing this whole proclamation to the suitors being like I'm gonna beat him and all this because you guys want me to uh, he looks at Odysseus in disguise and he calls him a pot-bellied pig <laughs> good insults from Homer but again at the same time you're like this man has done call to you calm down he even threatens him by saying that he's gonna punch him so hard his teeth are gonna fall out and he's going to litter the ground with all of them he's gonna like you know sew them into the ground and all of this grimy sh ew but Antonis overhears this and he is well excited that they are at each other's throats right I mean okay at each other's throats it's really Eris who is at Odysseus in disguise's throat Odysseus in disguise is just like I really want nothing to do with this but Antonis gets so excited and he calls over the rest of the suitors and he's just like we haven't had anything like this like, this is well exciting that they want to fight and we get to you know watch it and experience it yes let's encourage them to do this so he gets all of them to huddle around them to huddle around the two of them as, as the two of them are sort of you know like doing the whole boxing dancing thing and they're like yeah I'm totally ready to get into this ring and I'm totally ready to fight this guy and Antonis actually puts forward a reward that he says whoever wins of the two of them will not only get to eat a really nice goat sausage for dinner which is just like peak because the beggars only get bread as we've seen before so he says that not only can they have that but they can also eat it at the table with them as opposed to in the corner on the floor so now the stakes are getting higher right so both of the men, both Odysseus in disguise and Eris are getting amped up for this for this whole thing. But Odysseus in disguise starts getting a bit worried because he knows that he looks really old and all of this. And so he's worried that if he does land a punch on Eris, that all of the other suitors are going to come for him. Right? All the other suitors are going to start defending Eris and, and punch him in, in the event that this happens. So he pipes up right now and he says, I need you all to swear an oath. I would like you all to promise me and to swear to the gods that if 
I do manage to land anything on Eris, you are not going to step in, you're not going to punch me. But also that the same goes, if Eris hits me, you're not going to step in and to punch him. It's just going to be between the two of us. And all of the suitors, they're like, yeah, sure, that's totally fine. So they all swear this oath. And Telemachus walks down from where he is to join them in this sort of makeshift, you know, ring, <laughs> boxing ring that they have in the middle of the hall. And he tells Odysseus in disguise not to worry because um, all the suitors have made this oath and that he's watched it. So if any of them want to go against the oath that they've sworn, they will have to deal with him, right? And he's like, I will defend whoever it is that does this, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm going to punch that suited, no problem, right? He, he threatens them. And he says that also he really shouldn't worry because Antonus and Eurymachus are men of good sense and they're not going to go against an oath and they're not going to back up anybody who does go against an oath, which we know because <laughs> we know this from a previous book that Odysseus in Disguise had told him to flatter the suitors so that they don't clock on to him knowing Odysseus in Disguise at all. So that's the only reason why he's doing this. He doesn't genuinely believe that any of these men have good sense. Odysseus is comforted by this and he starts to take off all of his rags because obviously he has to get ready to fight and they don't fight in, in clothing in ancient times. So he takes off his rags and as he's doing this, Athena comes down and makes him look a lot bigger. So it makes him look like a commander, like he looks like a warrior. He's, you know, muscled and all of this despite looking very old. And it's safe to say that Eris just shits himself. And all the other suitors are looking at him being like, Eris doesn't have a chance. This is hilarious. So seeing this, Antinous threatens Eris and says to him, look, if you don't win this, if you let him beat the shit out of you, well, then I'm going to send you to Echetus. Now, Echetus, for all of you guys, is a king. And Antinous does highlight exactly what the punishment is going to be from Echetus, because apparently he is a terrifying king, okay? And Antinous says, I will send you to Echetus, and he will not only cut off your nose and cut off your ear with a rusty blade, but he will also cut off your genitals from the root and feed them to his dogs, and they will eat it raw. And you're sitting there like what the f it's grimy to say the least and that reaction that you have yeah iris has that reaction too and he's just like <laughs> okay so we're not going to go into the whole details of the fight but what you guys just need to know is that odysseus in disguise obviously beats the sh out of iris like literally at the end of it picks him up and like throws him outside and he crumples against this wall outside and he's just sort of like bleh, like totally demolished against it and uh, and so odysseus in disguise wins and he doesn't even take a moment to really take in the victory that he just immediately walks over to the table and, and puts his booty down in a chair. And we've got um, Antinous who actually delivers the, the goat sausage that he had just won. He's the one that actually puts it in front of Odysseus in disguise. And then we have Amphinomus who I've mentioned before. He walks over with a, a basket of bread and he gives Odysseus in disguise some for his, his winnings. Now, when he does this, he sort of stops over and, and takes a moment to do this. So Odysseus in disguise has a moment to really look at Amphinomus and he stops him and he says, oh, you look just like your dad, like his name is Nissus. He's this great man, so you must also be a great man. And in this moment, Odysseus delivers one of the, I think the most famous line from this entire book. So I obviously wrote it down um, so that I don't completely butcher it. So the most famous line out of the whole of the Odyssey, it's one of my favorite lines as well. And, and the, the explanation after this, because obviously he says the line, he doesn't initially explain it, but he will in a second. So the line is of all that breathe and crawls on this earth, Mother Earth breeds nothing more feeble than a man. If you have your Fagel's translation, it is line 150, because the whole point of him saying that to Amphinomus is that someone's life has cycles, that, that men put too much faith, men, he says this in general, put too much faith in the gods, that if the gods look fondly on them and give them this really great thing, that they think that they're very much set for the rest of their lives, sort of like, you know, the rest of the suitors are, that they presume that because they're wealthy now, they will always be wealthy and they can always act in this way. But he goes on to explain that actually somebody's life is like the cycle of a day. That he says the same way that a day comes and goes and a new one comes, a new cycle starts, that happens with somebody's life. That he again says, you know, I'm, I'm this beggar who was once this great man and all of this. And in the same way that he had a great life once and now he's a beggar, that, you know, that's just his next cycle, that he's okay with it and he's accepted this. And that's what he means by that quote, which is why that quote is so important. And it's sort of like a little life lesson that's sort of thrown into this whole, this, this whole end part of the book. But this speech is really long, like I'm just paraphrasing it for the point of this video. So you guys really should go and read it to understand the depth of what Odysseus is really saying and the beautiful imagery that he uses to explain it. Because the way that he ends it is he just sort of says that because all of the suitors are there and they are uh, courting this, this woman who has a loyal, well, she's loyal to her husband and, and her husband is this great man and, and this great king, that um, they're all gonna be punished for it and he does highlight that then he says that he hopes that none of them come face to face with Odysseus because none of them will live to see another day if they do but that is the end of the scene in the hall and we cut to Penelope because I didn't mention this in the end of the other book but Penelope has this thing throughout the whole book where she sort of hops between the hall and her room now she's back up in her room and she's been there for a hot second so she's up there and she calls over Eurynome who's one of her serving maidens and she says that she wants to go back to the suitors 
wants to talk to them. She wants to go and have a word with them, but she doesn't want to go alone. So can Yurinomi go and call these two other um, of her trusty handmaidens to come with her because she's embarrassed to go alone? And Yurinomi says, yeah, of course, I will obviously go and find them. However, do you want to like take a bath first because you're looking kind of questionable? Maybe you should like look your best when you go down there to talk to them. And Penelope just says, why the f would I do that? I haven't looked good since Odysseus left for Troy, which I say that in kind of a funny way, but at the same time, it's really sad because she says that all of her beauty, all of her happiness and everything was taken with Odysseus the day that he went. And um, she, she doesn't have any of that left in her anymore, which is really heartbreaking. But the way that she says it is like, no, I don't really care about taking a shower, Yurinomi, just get me the ladies. And so Yurinomi leaves to go and retrieve uh, uh, the two women that she had called on. And Athena then comes down. She decides that Penelope is going to take this really short but very effective nap. That's what she's decided in this moment. So she puts Penelope to sleep and Penelope goes into the super deep sleep. But as she's there, Athena sprinkles all of these like God giving gifts onto her, you know, just like beauty. Like she has, uh, you know, like her cheeks go all plump and pink and like, you know, she's glowing and all of this sort of stuff. And when the women come in, which can't be any more than 10 minutes later, right? You've got to think that in, in a time span, Penelope's only napped for about 10 minutes. And these women come in and they start chattering and that wakes up Penelope. And when she wakes up, she's just like, okay, let's go down and let's do this. And they go down to the hall. She goes down with the two other handmaids on either side of her, very Charlie's Angels-esque, as I keep saying, we've got to picture this, this whole like powerful, beautiful woman coming down and standing there and like posing. And these two other women standing and posing next to her being like, yeah, that's our And the suitors look at her. Oh my gosh, you guys, the suitors look at her and their knees just start quaking because they're just like, holy shit. She looks amazing today. This woman is hella hot. But before she can actually address them, she turns to Telemachus and she basically says, where the fuck is your good sense? And why are you talking to the suitors so much? Why are you befriending them? But no, stop doing that. Like literally tells him that as he gets older, he gets more handsome, but he gets less smart. <laughs> like it's not a good thing. Like she's just basically saying, you need to like check yourself, man, because you shouldn't be talking to these people and you shouldn't be befriending them because you might end up like them. Like what the fuck is wrong with you? The point that Penelope really hits home is that Telemachus is sort of allowing a lot of things to happen in front of him which he shouldn't be allowing as the prince. And so, you know, she hears about this whole fight that's happened and she says to him like, look, this is not okay because if this man had gotten hurt, it would have been on you as the person who's in charge of the room and in charge of the palace. You should not be letting these things happen. And Telemachus does reply and say that he understands his mother and he understands where she's coming from. But he says that lucky in this case, but actually it worked out in their favor because the other guy, the other beggar who came in is now crumpled against the wall outside. And before Penelope can really respond and like tell him off, which she probably is going to, even though Telemachus was like, I do feel everything that you're saying and blah, 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 but then finishes in the stupid way that he just did. She's probably gonna be like, Telemachus, get your shit together. But obviously, um, Eurymachus feels like he needs to speak. I don't know why this man is constantly like, I'm going to take the reins. But he does though. And he says to Penelope like, oh my goodness, you look so beautiful and you look amazing. And you're, you have a beautiful mind and a beautiful face and a beautiful body. And you're just like this incredible queen. And if only the rest of Greece could see you now, then you would have a whole other slew of suitors who would be outside the palace, like wanting to marry you. And Penelope has the funniest response because she literally looks at him and she goes, oh no. Like literally just tells him to stop talking. Cause she's just like, no, for a number of reasons. She's like one, I don't want that. That would suck. And two, she also says that all of her glow, all of her sparkle, all of her beauty left with Odysseus when he left. Like she's not hiding this from anybody. She's like, I'm not as beautiful as I used to be because Odysseus is gone and he's been gone for a very long period of time. And I will be most beautiful when I'm with him or when he comes back. Like, sorry, but you're not gonna get that Penelope anymore. And it's now that Penelope launches into this story where she tells all the suitors that when Odysseus left, he had told her that he doesn't know if he would be allowed back from Troy because he says that the Trojans are such good fighters, uh, that they're, you know, amazing warriors and all of this, that, that he doesn't know if the gods will allow him to return to Ithaca because obviously they can't allow everybody to return home from this great war that he's going on. And so because of that, he tells her that obviously she should wait for him, obviously, because he's like, I could very well come back. And if there's another man here, I'm going to be pissed. But he says that if it gets to the point where Telemachus is growing a beard, then she has been given permission by him to remarry, even if he doesn't return, and even if he's gonna return later. When Telemachus has a full beard, when he's like a proper man and all of this, she can remarry without any sort of consequence um, on, on Odysseus's retaliation end. And she's really upset by this because she says that now she can see that reality coming to light. And she says she's even more upset by this because most women, when they're going through this, she says that, you know, suitors constantly bring them gifts and they lavish them in all of this gold and all of this stuff. And you guys are sitting here eating my food and not giving me anything. Like, how am I supposed to even enjoy this process as sad as I am when you guys aren't helping me? Now, this is well funny because Odysseus, obviously, Odysseus in disguise, is listening to 
this. And he's so proud of Penelope because he knows that all she's doing is trying to trick them out of gifts. Like she just wants <laughs> like shiny things and she wants nice gifts from them. And he clocks this immediately. He's not even mad. He's actually really proud of her. And we get this really long list of all of the suitors who go out to go and get her all of these nice gifts, like jewelry and, and all of this stuff. And they come in and they present it to her. And the end of the scene is Penelope and her two handmaidens walking out with their arms filled with gifts and bringing them up to her bedroom. And I just think that that's well funny because she just came down with one purpose. She was like, you know what? I want to be treated like an actual queen by these men. And she, she got what she went down there for. And you've got to respect that. Like, go. With Penelope gone and the night sort of coming to an actual end, like actual night coming in over the evening, the suitors turn to song and dance to sort of just wind everything down. More of the serving women in the palace come down to the hall to get this whole fire sort of going, because obviously nighttime means that it's gonna be cold, especially on an island. So they start getting this fire going and Odysseus in disguise walks over to them and he says, you know what, your, your lady, your queen, she's had a really rough day today, so maybe you guys should go up and, uh, and, and, you know, tend to her and make sure that she's okay. And I, a decent disguise, I will sit here and I will make sure that the fire keeps, keeps going. So don't even worry about that. Like he comes in and he does order them. That's what Homer describes. He says that it was an order, but he's very polite about it. And he's very much putting Penelope first and saying that they should go and help her. And obviously, obviously all the ladies turn around and they just start laughing at him. <laughs> like literally they're just like, who the f is this beggar telling us what to do? Excuse you. And in fact, one of them in particular, whose name is Melantho, so she stands up and she really starts berating him with all of these insults and just really dragging him in the gutter for no clear reason, aside from the fact that he is a beggar or appears to be a beggar. She's like going at him right now, okay? And what's funny is that there's a note here right now, which I think is one of the most important notes in the entire book, not in the entire Odyssey, in the entirety of this book, is that Melantho is sleeping with Eurymachus, so of course she's gonna be a like anybody who is impacted by Euromachus turns into a Hello, the goat herd was an absolute to him as well. So now Melantho is throwing out all of these things and Homer's like, well, no wonder because she was sleeping with Euromachus. And I'm like, you got a terrible choice in men. She basically says to him that he's really gassing himself up only because he has beat Eris and now he's really full of himself. And Odysseus just sort of turns to her and just goes, just you wait. Like I paraphrase obviously, but I did write down the line. It's between line 380 and 381 in the Fagel's translation where he basically says that it's a paraphrasing. Again, I paraphrase a lot whenever I say quotation marks, but she, he basically says, just you watch out. And he says that because of what she says, he will go and tell Telemachus about all of it because he has no power himself. So he's like, I'm gonna go and tattle on you and tell Telemachus and tell the prince. And he, if he finds out, he's gonna chop you up into lots of little pieces and he's gonna chop up all of your ladies who stood here and didn't defend me. Obviously all of them bricks and so they do scatter. They just like leave him alone and they're like, He's totally right. And so Odysseus can then uh, tend to the fire and keep it going in the hall. Athena then has no desire to make this the last thing that happens to Odysseus. Cause again, we are trying to push him over the edge to want to kill the suitors. So Athena decides that all of the uh, suitors are now just gonna like speak their truth. And obviously Euronachus is the first one to stand up. And he has this moment, we're sort of going back on this whole beggar thing, this whole like beggar berating uh, and laziness is really what the whole speech is about. And he says to Odysseus, if I offered you a job, if I offered you good payment, if I offered you a house, if I offered you a home, if I offered you a family, if I offered you food, if I offered you anything in the world, you would still choose to be a beggar because you're lazy and all of this sort of stuff. Like the, the arguments that we've heard before from other characters, he just relays and he says it to Odysseus in disguise yet again. Odysseus in disguise in response says, you sir are sick with pride. And if the real Odysseus was here and he heard you say that you would be running out of the gates and trying to find shelter and trying to find safety from him. Euromachus then says that he's gonna pay for that rant because it, it does go on in quite a long-winded way, unsurprisingly, it's Odysseus. So it goes on and Euromachus says that because of that rant, he's going to pay and he basically gives out the exact same insults as Melantho had just, just done, which is very appropriate considering that. So obviously he gives out the exact same insults and he yells them at Odysseus to the point where he gets so worked up, like he works himself up to such a point that he picks up a stool and he throws it again at Odysseus. This is the second stool that has been thrown at Odysseus in disguise. But this time Odysseus is sort of, you know, he's aware that this is now a weapon, right? He knows that the suitors, they're like throwing stools across the room. And so he sees it coming and he ducks immediately. And it actually goes past him because he's ducking near Amphinomus and it goes past him and he hits a wine steward in the hand. So I don't know, the, the wine steward isn't described as holding anything, but literally the wine steward has his hand out and the stool whacks it. And the wine steward is like, yo, 
what did I do? Which obviously makes all of the rest of the suitors break out into uproar because they're just like, this is ridiculous and we should not be fighting over or because of a beggar. Absolutely not. Telemachus now steps in and he just says that now it looks like the time where all the suitors should go home, but obviously he can't make them because it's not the hospitable thing to do to kick everybody out of your house. So he says, I'm not making you leave, but I highly advise that you go home and you sleep or you go back to wherever it is that you're staying and sleep because like tonight seems to be over. And Finimus then echoes this. He stands up and he says that actually because Telemachus has spoken with such uh, with, with such grandeur, that he's spoken with such power, that they should all respect him, and so they should all pour out one more libation to the gods, and then they should all go uh, go to their respective sleeping quarters and sleep. So the book ends with a herald mixing all of this wine and then passing it out to all the suitors uh, in a glass and then, well, in a goblet, and then all of them pour it out to the gods, and then they drink the rest of the wine to their heart's content, and then they all go to, well, the beginning of the next book is saying that they all go to bed. The end of this book is specifically that they are just all drinking to their heart's content. Um, But yeah, that's the end of book 18. Amazing! So thank you guys for tuning into this book. Book 18 is not as long, but again, we have to prep because there's a lot of stuff we really do. The whole point of this stuff is that we push Odysseus over the edge and we really need to get on that level. Again, like I said at the beginning of this video, that when he does finally kill the suitors, we are all on his side because you can't have your main character slaughter, uh, you know, nearly hundreds of people in one go. Nearly, it's 114. We did the maths already. But you know, he can't slaughter 114 people and have the audience on his side by just doing it randomly. Like we all need to get there with him. So that's what this is setting up for. And um, yeah, thank you guys for tuning into book 18. I'll be seeing you next time with book 19 here on Monix. We'll see you then.